like I, I the place like I was thinking I've got so many ways to kick this off, but I was thinking like you're you're a father, is that right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and a grandfather, and yeah, a yeah. grandfather. Congratulations. 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 Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Like, how have you gone about cultivating confidence in your children? Oh, I married a still a brilliant woman. Called... <laughs> Great answer. I love it. <laughs> oh, doc, Dr. Fiona Doherty, who's I think is the best clinical psychologist in the world. And she she was she was the one who first um, being a married, she just she kept saying, you know, confidence. If you can give your if you can give your child confidence, really, the rest is fine. Confidence is absolutely central. I, 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 the reason I wrote a book on that was because, really, of hearing her saying that and seeing it, and, and she was so so keen. Our, you know, our kids did things like take a summer job or a Saturday job. You know, uh, there was good evidence. I, I mean, I find she knew this, but I found out later. The, the research shows that you know, kids that that uh, uh, rub up against. You know, if you've got a Saturday job, or a, you know, you, it's not all easy going. Like you might be in a nice school and good friends and be popular and good and good at everything, but you don't rub against hard edges so much. And people that don't have any kind of set any mini setbacks, who don't who have too too blessed a childhood, um, they can end up more emotionally vulnerable when they're young adults. And there's good evidence for that. So you need a bit of you need a bit of um, you you need to to understand that it's okay to feel anxious or or fed up sometimes that they don't don't you know don't don't start being frightened of these feelings as if it's something awful, but if you've overprotected a childhood, yeah, um, you you never learn that, and so but then when you I mean I don't you can't but face some tough times, and then that's when if you if you, if you basically you haven't been vaccinated emotionally vaccinated by so I'm not I'm, <clears throat> I'm not advocating for I never imposed a Spartan regime on my children but all of them all of them uh, had you know did jobs and they you know rubbed up against the world and went you know traveled to school on their own and things like that and, and it's you, you can just see that they're all of them confident and, and that, that I mean if you if, if you have nothing else for a child feeling confident about the things they do is just the most valuable resource uh, and now of course I'm seeing it with my grandchildren you know that just the same necessity for them to you know to feel that incredible amazing it's it's, like a, it's, it's, a, it's almost see, I, I was gonna say it's almost like without getting too lost in the weeds it's making sure that they feel supported and safe but also making sure that you push them out into the world when they're ready to go so that they do feel, they, yeah. so they can take one step without feeling like they've got to jump off the board. No, oh, exactly, exactly. And the, th the thing about, um, you can never feel 100% safe in the world. You know, you can never be sure that that girl or boy you ask out is not going to you know, tell you to go away, you know. Um, there's always risk in any going forward there's always uncertainty and the thing about confidence what it does is it helps you bridge uncertainty it helps you and that's the whole basis of human development but it's also the basis of personal development that you you cannot be certain that you're going to succeed in that career or succeed in that relationship or succeed in that sport or be able to do that thing you can never be 100 percent certain if it's worth doing because the you know, if you're stretching yourself, there's always going to be uncertainty. And the amazing thing about confidence, it helps you get over that uncertainty. And if you do get over that uncertainty, then your brain responds with this big reward, which actually is huge. It's, it's like, acts like compound interest. It, it, it's a kind of confidence ladder that takes you up through life. And, and so, so that's why if you take two five-year-olds, one of them equal intelligence, equal looks, and one of them is slightly more confident than the other. That confidence will take the confident five-year-old so that 30 years later, there's an enormous difference between them because the, the, that little bit of confidence means that kid is more likely to try out that new thing or approach that potential new friend or, or ask the teacher that question. And just taking that small step means 
it just it, 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 that tiny increment of advance goes on but then that means the next increment is slightly better and that's like compound interest it's exponential over a lifetime and that that's that's for you can i can i go I, yeah. it, it seems like failure and the the ability to embrace failure is a key part of learning like when i watch my kids learn a language they fumble along and as adults regularly we're kind of afraid to embrace that failure because there's more pride i wonder how important is it to have that humility it's a great great question and it's absolutely central that you know confidence you can learn to be more confident and one of the aspects of that learning is learning to how to approach failure. Um, because the, we know this from brain imaging studies. If you, the, the, the people who uh, approach failure in a particular way, uh, they, they do learn from it. Because, and here's the reason. So one of the main differences between people who respond to failure differently is whether they hold a fixed theory about themselves or a change theory of themselves. This is the great work of Carol Dweck, the psychologist at Stanford. So some of us believe that our intelligence, our looks, our personality are kind of inherited. Uh, you know, they're something we've acquired. You know, there's not. Whereas others say, yeah, there's a bit of inheritance, but there's an awful lot with the decisions I've made, the people I've known, the teaching I've got, you know, the, the efforts I've made. So it's like a mixed model. If you take these two people and you subject them both to failure, say failing an exam or being criticized or you know in school, the ones who have the fake theory, their brain responds completely differently to failure. What they do is their uh, their frontal lobes of the brain, the middle of the frontal lobes, goes into full. Oh my God, this is a threat to my ego. Maybe I'm not bright. Maybe I'm not so good. And, and the memory centers of the brain, the hippocampus, get switched off. So even though they've just failed the test, but the teachers just told them the right answer, but their brain is so involved in protecting their ego from this threat to their self-concept that they don't, they, don't, they don't remember the right answer, so they don't learn from failure. Whereas the, the kid that realizes that their abilities, their personality, their emotions are a result of a whole mesh of things, you know, the luck, effort, you know, relationships, teaching, all sorts of things. They say, oh, they do have the same panic response to failure. So they, they're more likely to, to the memory sense is more likely to be switched on when, when they hear the right thing and they learn from failure. And actually failure is a much better teacher than success. Mm. It's much more... <laughs> And so, so that's one of the, I mean, it's a great point. That's one of the really critical aspects of confidence is embracing failure. It's not nice. We don't like it. But if you run away from it and try and, you know, you, you don't learn from it. And that, that, that's, um, that's a shame. And mm -hmm. uh, it makes you more frightened of failure. So some people adopt a kind of, they, they hold themselves back in life because they've got this kind of, they get into a kind of threat mindset, trying to protect themselves from criticism, protect themselves from being excluded, protect themselves from failure. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough road when you, when you adopt that. And that's why, that's why kids, you know, who, 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 who don't go overprotected and don't get kind of, you know, helicoptered the whole time. And, you know, they, they, they end up more confident because they, they're they not frightened of, of failure to the same degree. Yeah, but then, 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 then in the other other extreme, I was thinking of more like people who've who've achieved a lot of success and they, they're, you know, they've, they're successful in their field. Sometimes they get very fearful because they're protecting their lot. You know, it suddenly gets in fear of failure because they've reached this destination. They've got these accolades, people perceive them in a way. And then, then their fear of failure just amplifies massively. And as a result, their confidence and their kind of creativity and, and, you know, the decision-making is slightly different than someone who, you know, that what got them to be successful. Is that something you've come across? Well, um, you know, generally the greatest source of confidence is success and the greatest source of success is success. So generally speaking, in many domains, 
the, 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 the more successful you, you get, the less vulnerable you feel. But that's, that's not true for some domains like entertainment or even academia. You know, if you're, so, you know, or, you know, if you, if you're a film movie star or, or, or actor, you know, you're only as, you're really only as good as your last movie. And if you're, if you're a high flying academic, you're only as good as your last paper. And so for people who are very, very driven in that way, then yes, it can come particularly maybe at a certain point in their life and they think either their intellectual abilities or their, or their looks or, or some other thing is changing and they start to have that kind of fear of failure that you mentioned. But it's interesting, you know, if you compare Oscar nominees with Oscar winners, Oscar winners live extra four years because of the Oscars compared to Oscar nominees. And it's nothing to do with wealth, nothing to do because they're all equally wealthy. It's just that winning an Oscar gives you this badge that takes you out of the rat race of competition. So it's no longer the case that you're only as good as your last movie. Yeah, you're now an Oscar. You've now got this, you know. Got it. You've reached yeah. a certain class. You're up on a... You've reached a certain class. It takes you out of the rat race. So that means your body is not secreting cortisol, the stress hormone, for all these many interactions, all these little status games that go on of, you know, people trying to, to, to feel more superior to them, be, the put downs, the, the, the kind of reading of your friend has just been, you know, the huge success in the movie and your last one bombed. All these, every time they get these little, you know, there's, there can be hundreds of them a week or, or certainly a month. You, your body's secreting a little bit more cortisol. And, and, and when people, if you get too much cortisol for too long, it actually damages the cells in your body. So, and then for Nobel Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners live a year and a half earlier, uh, longer than, than Nobel nominees. Again, nothing to do with wealth. It's just this, this, yeah, you're taking, you're lifted out of the academic rat race. You know, you're, wow. you're no longer just as good as your last paper. We never ever thought we'd become health ambassadors. As 21 year olds, we were meat eating, point swilling, burger munching jocks. And lo and behold, a year later, age 22, we adopted a plant based diet, gave up alcohol, started into yoga and swimming in the sea. And that's been 20 years now. In terms of physical health, we think it starts at your feet. We've been wearing Vivo barefoot shoes for about seven years, and I love them. They're the only type of shoes I wear. I feel more myself. I feel I get more feedback from the environment. My kids wear them. Um, they got a huge different variety of ranges, and they're the only shoe I would wear. Uh, Vivo have offered you, our wonderful listeners, 15% discount when you use the code HAPPYPAIR15 at checkout. And right now, they're offering free access with every purchase to the ultimate resource for natural health, which is a course curated showcasing our human potential with some of the best and most progressive leaders in the health and wellness space. Check out the link in the show notes to find out more and avail of your discount with the code HAPPYPAIR15 at checkout. That's vivobarefoot.com, HAPPYPAIR15 for 15% off your pair of shoes. I'm really excited about this one and I think it's real. Like one thing that I think is so relevant to everyone is you talk about confidence being a skill and most people listening, at least most adults typically see I'm confident or I'm not confident. Yeah. It's not like yeah, yeah. It, we don't see it as a skill, at least in the modern yeah. way we speak about it. I wonder if you could talk yeah. about how it's a skill and how people listening, even if they're unconfident, can actually build that muscle. Yeah, they certainly can. And I kind of outline in my book, How Confidence Works, I do outline a number of these. Um, and uh, we've we'll, we'll addressed one of them, which is just your attitude to failure. If you, and, and, you know, if you can change that, you will become less fearful of failure and that will help your confidence. So that's one. A second, a second thing to do is to um, actually uh, take action. Anxiety is the greatest enemy of confidence. And first of all, let me just say what confidence is. It's not, it's not self-esteem. Self-esteem is your self-evaluation. Uh, and it's not optimism. Optimism is the belief that things will work out. Confidence is the belief you can do something. I can do something, and if I do it, the good thing will happen. And confidence is domain-specific. It's not a general all-purpose thing. Okay, so it, is, so it is skill-specific. It's more like craft-specific rather than... Skill-specific. You can be a confident sports person, but are very unconfident socially and vice versa. So, and that's because confidence 
is, is secret sauces is linked to action in the brain. Confidence helps you do stuff. And when you do stuff, you're more likely to get a reward. The thing about anxiety, which is a big enemy of confidence, anxiety activates the brain's threat networks. So it makes you pull back because you're anticipating punishment all the time. Okay, so you, you you call off that date. You say, oh, I've got a headache. I'm not coming out for dinner. I, don't, I wouldn't go to that interview. Or, oh, I've no point to me applying for that. All of that's, that's a pull back. So across the world, there's been a study of 40 different countries. Anxious people do less stuff. They do less of everything because they're constantly anticipating or frequently anticipating threat and punishment. And con confident, anxiety is the great enemy of confidence, but confidence is a great antidote to anxiety. And that's why if you're feeling anxious about something, um, doing the thing you're anxious about in spite of the anxiety, taking action in spite of adversity is a huge source of increased confidence. Just doing that thing gritting your teeth and doing it in spite of the fact you don't feel good. You don't feel you're feeling anxious about it. And if you, so that's what that's, so taking action, Rumi, the Afghanistani Persian poet said that the road only appears with the first step. So you have to take action. So the first kind of skill for confidence I mentioned was attitude to failure. Second one is action, taking action. Do the thing you're anxious about, but do it in a tiny step. Set yourself goals that just stretch yourself a little bit. And that can be to do with exercise, it can be to do with diet, it can be to do with losing weight, it can be do with, to do with um, academic uh, progress, it can be to do with your job, it can be to do with relationships. It's about, you know, it's about just setting yourself goals that are not too easy and not too hard, that give you that kind of, can I do this, that kind of edgy feeling. So that's the, the so that's two of the skills. Uh, Brilliant. Yeah, and the, there's a the, there's a, a third one which is uh, to do with just saying the words. Um, you know, uh, you know, saying to yourself, you know, I can do this, even though inside you don't believe it. Inside, there's your stomach's in a turmoil. But just faking the words, I can do, or, or you can do this even better. When you talk to yourself in the third person, you can do this. You actually um, are uh, tricking the brain networks, even though inside this part of you doesn't believe this. That going through the, the motions, the verbal motions of confidence actually helps you um, to, to, to actually be more likely to do it. So it's this part of the kind of training up the, 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 the kind of circuits of the brain to get them nearer that kind of confidence stands. So, um, wait, so, so, so that expression, yeah. fake it till you're make it, actually they sensed it. Yes, yes, yes. And there used to be, used to be you know, you, I don't know if you remember for a while, there was a couple of papers arguing that if you really adopted a very wide, expansive stance if you were giving a talk. And you mean Sajid Javid, the, the UK minister, famously kind of this ridiculous posture on stage at some conference, his legs spread and his arms out. Yeah, because it was supposedly this, this um, uh, our pose, as it was called, increased testosterone, which increased dopamine, which lifts your mood and, 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 and creates confidence. Now, that research turned out not to be correct, okay? However, subsequent research has shown that holding yourself small undercuts your confidence. So you 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 go in to meet your boss, or you 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 you. This often often happens to to women in the presence of men. Say in a meeting, they will kind of make themselves small. In the, the, this may be male dominated meeting, and that making yourself small does decrease your confidence and your sense of empowerment. So there is a question of not necessarily doing the ridiculous big power pose, but certainly standing tall, yeah. holding, yourself, holding yourself tall, recognizing that if your body adopts a confidence posture because our emotions and behavior are embodied, you can trick the brain circuits 
into creating some of the internal feelings associated with that external faking. <laughs> yeah. Well it, well, it, well, it, well, it, well, it makes sense just from a physiological point of view, because when someone's feeling bad, they'll typically be more hunched over and looking more towards yeah. the ground. Yeah. Where if someone feels yeah. good, they're typically, their chest to be out, they'll be open, exactly. they'll be looking up. And that's typically a confident physiological position rather than, exactly. you know, exactly. trying to hide and curl down. So as a basic human, you know, like there is, there is, you know, power poses to some degree will influence one's mood. They and will, confidence. they will. I mean. It's it's just you know it's it's they don't have to be exaggerated, but they can be, you know, standing tall, and that's why all armies and and, and old fashioned schools used to get concentrated posture very much, you know, and and slumped posture will 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 tend to just a mirroring internally of that of that posture. So so that's a, that yeah that's an element, you know. Um, yeah, amazing. I was I was going to move it into into like uh, confidence in terms of gender because I really uh, yeah. like I, I've yeah. heard you talk about this and I think it's so yeah. interesting between yeah. men and women and yeah. you know what gender really between what what are the differences in terms of confidence and gender? You know, I was shocked when I set about writing this book, and I thought, oh, I'll just do a. We'll do a chapter on male female differences in confidence, you know, shop. I ended up feeling humbled and uh, amazed and disconcerted at the degree to which women are disadvantaged by the the way confidence works internally and externally in the world. Um, and that differs across countries. So the, the, the male-female difference in confidence is smallest in North America and biggest in Scotland and Ireland. Wow. Yeah. And particularly in Scotland. Why is, why is and, that? Oh, I'm sure it's, it's, I mean, in America, there are many more powerful women in senior positions. You know, there's not, there's not a, a female deference to the females uh, aren't kept in their boxes so much as they are in the in in, in this part of the world and particularly in Scotland. Um, so uh, and and the thing about the and uh, the, the classic kind of nineteen fifties feminine self image was one that was a the opposite of what you would expect of confidence. You know, if if you take if you take a man and a woman in a meeting. You know, and the man says, I don't think that's correct. I think we should do X. People go, oh, he's confident. The woman exactly says exactly the same words, exactly the same tone, saying, oh, she's an aggressive bitch, you know? And, and that's, 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 that's what women are against. That's what they are up against. And that's just one tiny example. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, if you, there was a study done showing getting eight-year-old children to make predictions about candidate who would win, which candidate would win an election based entirely on seeing their, their faces for a couple of seconds. And they were able to, with 70% accuracy, <clears throat> not perfect, they could predict who, which candidate would win an election. And it was entirely based on primitive assessment of competence on the facial features. And they found out that the, the assessment of competence was based on how masculine looking the face was. And this applied to women as well. So women were seen as more confident when they were, the faces were more masculine um, up to a point, however. But when a woman's face became too masculine, she began to be seen as less confident and, and, and difficult. So women have to tread this. And, and so... So there's this entirely, in our brains, there's this entire architecture um, which uh, sees, um, makes disadvantages women in terms of just their basic physical appearance. And, and they're, they have to navigate this narrow line between um, being appropriately confident and saying, it, you know, speaking, speaking clearly and loud, you know, and, and properly in a meeting, as opposed to being deferential and deferring, which would have been the kind of 1950s kind of feminine the, the image. So 
And we all, you know, we've all heard people talking about loud American women, you know, and or you know, some people don't like this. You know, there's a huge amount of this kind of obstacle to women, and then there, of course, there are internal aspects, because um, you know the cl- the old cliche about the job gets advertised, and there are eight key requisites. Um, the the woman uh, only has six of them, so she doesn't apply. The guy has four of them, but he applies and he gets the job. <laughs> and, and you know that that's can, the, the kind of apocryphal story, but it, it's, it's so true that the the, the women um, are are more likely to to less likely to wing it because confidence allows you to wing it, you know, and um, uh, that then of course uh, makes it harder to you're less you're, you're less likely to get the success experiences that arise. From winging it, you know, you wing it fifty percent of the time. You will, you win fifty percent of the time, you know, and and you you won't be devastated by failure. But that there's a whole set of uh, gender specific um, or, or differential responses to failure as well. It's it's amazing because what I'm hearing now is that like there's a huge correlation between confidence, one's capacity to embrace risk in the prospect yeah. of failure. Like that seems to be that yeah. there's this. You know they're just more open to failure, really. That that's part of it, and and it's at the it's at that you've had precedence of winning or precedence of being successful in the past. So therefore, you project yeah. that forward, and you don't Absolutely. necessarily. It's almost like a blind. You're blindsided to the degree that there's this big, um, you know, gap that you've got to jump over, but you don't see it because you're confident. You're like, of course we will do it, yeah. and that's and, and yeah. there's a huge difference between men and women confidence. At a very gender, and a- anyone identifies as men or as women, you know, there's a difference between. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there are, there are, you know, the sex plays a part here as opposed to gender as well, because um, it's partly heritable uh, confidence. It's partly, it's partly a skill learned, but it's also partly heritable, and that's the fact that we, you know, male sex produce more testosterone. Um, have more, and therefore likely to be more dominant, and and that's to do with sex, not self declared gender. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. to biological and hormones. That typically, yeah. if you're male, you have more testosterone. You're yeah, I mean, more. Well, men have ten to twenty times more testosterone than women, and that's huge implications for their behaviour, um, and that's not something that's that's affected by by psychological factors. It would be affected. It would be affected if you take stuff to change your hormones of course yeah is there uh, any truth that when a woman's menstruating her testosterone is higher and as a result is more confident or is that just hearsay i don't know about researching confidence so i think the testosterone does like co-vary peak, but yeah. yeah with with the menstrual uh, cycle i yeah. had a question in terms of you wrote a previous book called the winner effect and that was before yeah. you wrote the confidence book and i wonder yeah. doing that piece of research on what makes people succeed did confidence come out as one of the x factors and that further made you move in to write about confidence Yes, absolutely. You know, it was just, it was just, you know, I, I, I you know, I, it's so easy for me as a, a white male in a, you know, high status job. It's, it's, it's just so much easier than if I was a, you know, a young kid, you know, or, or, or younger or, or, or in some way different. And so, 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 so the thing about, the thing about success is it does multiply. And, you end up, you know, I started off as a working class Glasgow boy in a council house, so, so but I was just helped up by an incredibly generous social system that allows me to benefit from education and then come up into ultra privilege of the, you know, the middle classes, so that's, for, that's for sure. But now I'm here, it's so much easier for me to do things and to take steps and to say things that for someone that hasn't had that privilege uh, to do. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the worst... The worst thing about success is if you let it, um, if, you, if, you, if you become too attached to it and see it as something that's really due to your specialness and not due to luck, privilege, education, you know, you know relationships, etc. That and Fiona Doherty, I mentioned my wife Fiona, brilliant psychologist. She came up with this concept of of parents hiding the ladder. We lived in, 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 a while abroad and she was quite quite um, d- worried about many of the children of some of her very successful friends um, 
who seem to be underperforming hugely compared to the status of their parents. And she reckoned that it was because the parents allowed success to, to, to infiltrate their egos so much that they felt that, that who they were and what they could do and where they were in the, in the world was really just this kind of almost godlike specialness. You know, I'm just this. It wasn't because of luck. It wasn't because my company, you know, happened to be lucky when there was a dozen other companies that collapsed, even though the people were equally smart. You know, there was no humility or realizing, oh God, yes, combination, good education, lucky to have good parents, uh, you know, all of these things. So if you, but if you, if you start to kind of hold on to these things and say, oh, this is me, I'm so special. What your kids then see is this special godlike figure and there's no ladder to it because, well, there's no way up. There was no, it wasn't a question of trial and error, perse persevering through failure, you know, lucky breaks. There's none of, I, you know, then that's not, that's not how, why he or she is there. It's mainly he, it's not why he's there. He's there because he's so special and wonderful. I can never, I can never get that. So that's where he, he pulls up the ladder. He pulls up the ladder of success. Yeah. It's almost like and, the veil. Uh, it's almost like the Wizard of Oz yeah. with the veil behind yeah. the. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. really yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's that's the that and and that's a real trap when people become so eager. You know, people just uh, don't mean to have a sense of detachment from you know a kind of you know a certain ability to laugh at themselves and just say, God, oh, well, yeah, you're doing well, boy, but you know, ah. You know, you're, you're lucky. Those thousands smarter than you are not where you. you know. <laughs> and, and if you don't, you know that that kind of humility just just it makes you a much better, better parent and and and, and a better friend and, and and better to yourself. Really, you you you, you, you it'll be an easier life for you if you do that. A hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering in your experience as someone who's you know you know as a neuroscientist and a you know someone who's been in this field in terms of winning and success and confidence. Like, what would you do? What like obviously there's perseverance and there's commitment and dedication, all these type of things. Luck. How much would you see as luck being an outcome? Like, obviously there is the the factors. Like, if you were to put a percentage to it, I, I couldn't put a percentage to it because, uh, but it's I mean, luck has to be. And if you include luck, the luck of the draw of your parents, of your where you lived, you know, I was lucky. I I didn't I didn't live in a crime ridden council estate with gangs and drugs. You know, I I lived in a, a respectable council estate. You know, where you know there, there wasn't that going on. Had I been in the other kind of council estate, I, I you know I probably wouldn't have you know had the had the luck that I have. So that's just one tiny example of luck. Um, I'm lucky to have a you know a teach a particular teacher in school who got took an interest in you, um, you know who inspired you. The particular luck that you you did a particular course in college and not another one. The, the luck that you 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 didn't get sick or your parents didn't divorce. You know uh, all all of these most of actually most of it is luck. <laughs> like, I like that. Like I love the honesty. Of it is luck. Definitely more than fifty percent. I was thinking luck. that. I was thinking that. I was thinking it. I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> heavily weighted towards luck. And then, uh, yeah. and then yeah. uh, one thing I'd love to touch on is optimism versus pessimism. Because, like, I have three kids, and one of them inherently is a pessimist, like just inherently, and has been since he was able to speak. I shouldn't say he, since they yeah. were able to speak. Um, versus the others aren't so heavily weighted either way. They're more neutral. And like, if I care, yeah. if I compare my wife versus myself, one of us is an extreme optimist, and one of us when they walk into the room, the first thing they see is the things they don't like or the problems. And yeah, I mean, how does that impact confidence and, and success? And success. Well, we do it this way. Um, basically, we are all, uh, our fates are determined by the balance between two opposing forces. And these opposing forces act out in a primitive way in our brain. And that's between the force of eagerly anticipating reward, going forward, seeing potential reward in the future, that's called the approach system, and fearing punishment, seeing risk, and that's the avoidance system. And the, the approach system is more in the left hemisphere of the brain, the avoidance system is more in the right, 
the approach system is more linked to the dopamine system of the brain and the avoidance system more to the noradrenaline system of the brain. It's more complicated than that, but basically the two halves of the brain are in competition with each other. They're always trying to inhibit the other. And in most healthy people who are not depressed, there's a slight advantage of the approach system over the avoidance system, but there's still a tension between them. And uh, what happens is if one of these systems becomes over over activated, it can squish the other. So if you take, say, anxiety, someone that becomes very anxious or, 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 or starts to pay attention much more to threat, to remember past negative experiences and the effort for their body to be responding with anxiety, that, uh, that um, threat system can start to dominate the approach system so you, it starts to become inhibited. And so the, even, the ability to even think of doing, of, of taking an action to get a reward, that whole ability becomes diminished. You, even your ability to remember a past success becomes diminished. Your ability to notice the person smiling at you rather than the person frowning at you, that attention becomes diminished. So, and then of the opposite, if you start become over, uh, if you like, the, the, if the approach system becomes over inflated, then you all you can think of is the, the future reward. And whether that's in compulsive gambling or uh, cocaine addiction or greed, you know, someone who becomes totally obsessed with money and greed or power. And that power can be big political power, or it can be small family power. It can be power within a relationship. And so, and and then what happens is you get the approach system. So all your you and and that so the, you've got two different states of the mind. If you go put the approach system, you 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 believe you can do things. You're more confident. You're you're thinking only about rewards. This happened in the financial sector. I've heard that people who work as traders and everything in the banking system, most of what's in their mind is their bonus, how big their bonus is going to be. And this happened particularly in 2007, 6, coming up to the big crash. People's minds were so um, uh, distorted in favor of the of the approach system uh, that they, they couldn't think of risk. They had no even ability to remember past crashes. And this happens at the individual level as, as, as well. So... And to answer your question, you know, you need a healthy balance. You can't be, you can't be gung ho. Oh, oh, it's all going to be great. And, you know, you'll if you're going to start a business as, as you have, you have to, you have to be risk aware. You have to make sure you, you, you take risk. You have to make sure you, you mitigate risks, etc. You have to be self aware. So to answer your question, in any well adjusted family, it's pretty good. <laughs> To have a balance, you know, sometimes you know brains can connect together, so you get like a good division of labor. There's no bad, <laughs> I like that. No bad, no bad thing to have that. And of course, your children will then be more influenced, probably by one parent. Rather, some children may be influenced by one parent more than another, and will will adopt that orientation uh, to the world. But there's nothing fixed in the human mind. Is no one is doomed to be a pessimist all the time. It's all. It's always possible for people to, 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 to through discussion and thinking and, and rationalization, to actually learn to take a less pessimistic approach, approach to the world. Uh, you know, it's harder actually for people who are overconfident. It's much harder to, to break into their, their bubble, if you like. That, that that's a very difficult bubble to be, 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 you know, to break into. Because all the the narcissism that goes with that. So, so, that, so that's the kind of extreme end of overconfidence at its yep. you know extreme, yeah. as you said, freakish kind of example. Yeah. Whereas for most people listening, they're kind of going, okay, well, I want to be a little more confident. Confidence, yeah. as we've yeah. learned so far, it's a skill that we can learn, and it's it's skill specific. It's if I'm a very yeah. confident sports person, I mightn't be confident if I'm made to dance, or I mightn't be yeah, confident yeah, exactly. doing a public speech or cooking yeah, a dinner. Yeah, yeah. So, so confidence is very much skill specific. It can be learned just like any skill. And I guess the main thing which you've said so far is that it's about embracing failure, having this attitude where you can embrace failure. It's being able to kind of 
even when you don't feel like it, there's that aspect of overcoming Showing it and saying action, action. action. It's action orientated. So it needs yeah, to be, there's, yeah. there's that catalyst needed in that spark. And there's that kind of idea of saying you can do it in your head. And that also helps do it. Yeah. And there's another E, there's another E, which is attitude to yourself. And that's this, what I mentioned earlier, which is, do you have a, do you have a fixed theory about yourself or do you have a change theory of yourself? <clears throat> that, that, surprisingly, that, yeah. That, that, that's but, that growth mindset. Is that what you're talking? Because I've definitely heard exactly, that. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Growth Carl rather than fixed Dweck. mindset. Yeah. Carl Dweck. So um, I, I tried to learn guitar when I was a teenager and gave it up. <clears throat> tried to learn saxophone when I was middle age, gave it up. And each time I gave it up, it was kind of a fixed mindset. Oh, I'm just not musical. Okay. And um, turns out I had terribly bad instruments both time. <laughs> so <laughs> very, very, very awful instruments. And so I could never make a nice sound. Um, but I kind of didn't persist. I didn't persist. And that was, I didn't persist because learning is slow and up and down. And I didn't give the learning a, a chance to kick in because, I, because of this high level theory about myself. Oh, I'm just not able to learn musical instrument. It was only in COVID I started learning piano. My daughter started teaching me piano. And I'm still not very far on, but I love it. And I'm persisting and I'm learning because I've not crippled myself with a high level theory that says I can't do, I can't, uh, do this. And that, in terms of learning to be confident, if you have a, if you have a long history of maybe not great success in a particular domain, or you've 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 never really achieved what it is you want to achieve in many domain in any particular domains in life, it's very easy to have that kind of big theory of you know I don't have the, I don't have what it takes to uh, I can't do new stuff. These are all high level theories that are incompatible with learning to be confident. Because, you know, if you've had a pattern of thinking that's 40, 50, 30 years old, there are millions of repetitions of that pattern of thinking to be undone. And they can be undone. The brain is plastic, but they will not be undone unless you adopt a change or a growth mindset where you say change is possible. Now, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to be slow and up and down. And some days it's going to feel like I'm going backwards. But of all this, the, 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 you know, there's probably 10 different skills needed in confidence. They're all kind of not going to happen unless you tackle the big one, which is your theory about yourself. And, you know, I, I you know, just even physical, physical fitness, you two guys are, you know, big sportsmen and everything. I mean, I was never that... And so I had a very, you know, low self-image when it comes to, to sporting abilities. And, and uh, But, you know, he, again, it's all about individual goals and individual progress and not categorizing yourself and handicapping yourself with high-level, um, uh, you know, uh, theories about yourself. And the same is true in the emotional domain. Oh, I'm just an anxious person or, or I'm just a, I'm just a, a you know, I'm a pessimist, you know, all of these statements, they can never be true because the brain is too plastic for that. The human brain is designed to change with experience, but we we make that change less possible by by the, the breaks we put on with these high level self, uh, self concepts. It's almost like character, you know, that famous Buddhist quote, be careful of the action, the action becomes habit, habit becomes character. I think there's one yeah. in between that I missed, but it's the similar thing. And then yeah, once yeah, you define yeah. yourself, I'm not musical. Whereas one day you played yeah. a guitar and you weren't good at it. And then the next day yeah. you played the guitar and you still weren't good at it. So then you went, oh, yeah. I'm not musical. Yeah, yeah. So it's this definition. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's, that's do, you, right. Do, you, do you still swim in the sea? I do. I do. I was swimming yesterday. It was, it was absolutely freezing. But my, my son and I went down to, well, my, my son-in-law owned the, cause I'd said we might go for a swim and he phones, I'm going for a swim and it was grey and grim out. Both my son and I said, oh no, we're not going. And then, and then they were using it. Oh, and we'll have to go. And we're like, oh no. So four in the afternoon, or four in the afternoon, the slate grey sea at Collymore Arbor, 
amazing. I went in, but actually, of course, you feel amazing afterwards, you know. That's always the, worth it. Oh, glad always. you did it. You always. Know, you never ne- regret it. You mm. never regret it once you've done it. Yeah. And you always regret it if you think about it and don't do it. 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was in there today in the rain. And didn't it's really the when... last thing I wanted to do, like lashing no, exactly. rain and went in yeah. and came, came out with, the, you know, a basket of joy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, the chemical changes in your brain, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah, you'd know that as a neuro- neuroscientist. Like, it's, yeah, it yeah, really yeah. is an incredible daily habit. And also, I well, think it's the act of uh, overcoming something you don't want to do, you know, because you, you, right. no one ever, the cold sea, like, it's not in your nature to really... I know, I know. Unless you're roasting I, hot. I know, but, I, and, but there's that kind of having, having this mini triumph over reluctance and adversity. I mean, it really, it really, it, there's, there's not just the hormonal uh, chemical effects in your brain. There's this, this sense of, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I wonder, I, does that affect confidence? Because you know the way you have this triumph early in the day. Like, yeah. so, so we do it at sunrise every day and you get in the cold sea and like, you didn't want to do it. You didn't want to do it. You didn't want to do it. Yeah. And then you did it. <gasps> and you get this yeah. euphoria and loads of neuroadrenaline yeah. and all these nice chemicals yeah, yeah, in your yeah, brain. Yeah. But you've also triumphed. You've had one success does that kind of tend to play out and affect your confidence, would you think? It, it, it will if you allow it to. Now, you know, confidence is domain specific, but there is, you can, you can learn lessons across different domains. So, you know, the confident sports person can become the confident speaker if they, if they kind of do a little bit of thinking about, yeah, hold on a minute. I didn't feel a gear for that training this morning. I went out in the cold and the rain. I can, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really anxious about doing that public talk. And some people will be really anxious about it. But if I can do it for that, maybe I can do it for the other. So it's not a, an, it's not an, a kind of inevitable transfer of confidence skills from one domain to another. But you, it, it can spread, particularly if you, you give yourself the kind of high level, uh, you know, support. Can I give you that, that, that's, oh, sorry, yeah. you go. No, you go, you go. I'd love to hear your example. Uh, I had a really difficult, many years ago, a really difficult situation at work that was causing me a relationship with it. someone who was working for me. That I really had some horrible interactions with that, you know, meetings and it didn't go well and I didn't comport myself well, I think, either. And I was dreading this forthcoming meeting uh, we came up in the morning and think, oh, just anxious about it and think, what's going to happen? And then I had this sudden insight. And the insight was, I'm not, it, that's, I, this problem is not solvable by me. This is not a solvable problem. So I'm, here's me my brain going over, how am I going to solve this problem? I knew it wasn't. I came to that conclusion. I thought, actually, now this meeting on Thursday, I'm going to change my goal for that meeting. The goal is no longer to solve the problem in the external world. The goal is to behave coolly and professionally in the face of provocation. So I changed it to an internal goal. Now I'm a kind of bad tempered guy. You know, I can, I can, can be impulsive if someone says something provocative, I'll tend to respond. So I had to do a lot of internal mental rehearsal, imagining what would be said, <laughs> using my breathing to calm myself and respond in my mind's eye. I rehearsed a lot of times. Came, and by the time I came, the meeting was coming, I was actually not dreading it. I was excited to know whether I could do it because I'd set a, a different goal. And I went into the meeting and I came out and I did it. I behaved with Zen-like equanimity in the face of provocation, felt a million dollars. Problem in the external world was totally unresolved. It wasn't it got sorted out by people and such? But I learned that that sometimes, you know, sometimes tough things in life, um, difficult situations that seem so complicated and difficult to deal with, sometimes it's important to take control of what your definition of success is. I like that. I really like that. I think that's beautiful. And, 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 and switch to an internal goal. Say, oh, look, things are really tough just now. This is a bad situation. I'm going to set my goal to see whether I can maintain my 
or is my internal state? Can I can I keep myself relatively calm, or can I keep my mood up in spite of these terrible, you know, bad things that are happening? And once you set once you set a goal for yourself, you, and you know, if you set a goal that's clear enough that I, you know, I'm going to do X, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to not allow myself to to spend the evening worrying about this or scrolling online looking for stuff about this. I'm going to watch a movie or go for a run or, you know, go out for a nice meal or something like that. You can you can set kind of markers so you know whether you've achieved the goal or not. You can take control over your emotional state, even in situations where you don't have the full control of the external world. I like that. I think that's brilliant. Great one. And one final question, which Kiva kind of said earlier, which I thought was interesting in the terms of confidence. Like say with self-confidence, say you, you tell yourself, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to train. And if you continuously break that agreement with yourself, your self-confidence and your integrity obviously will diminish. But if you suddenly start doing it and then you do it again and do it again, ultimately your self-confidence and your integrity rises. Would that be true? Or is there truth in that? Oh, there's no doubt about it that um, the, the brain the brain works as a, a prediction machine, okay? So um, it predicts the outcome of events. And, you know, the first time we get a, a paycheck and a new job, our brain will, you know, because our brain is not used to us doing that, your brain will give this little surge of pleasure. First time we get a new car that we've bought, we'll get a surge of pleasure. But by the 10th paycheck and by the 10th ride in the car, your brain no longer gives the little spurt of dopamine with the increased mood and lowered anxiety that causes. You don't get the, the buzz. Um, so, so, so that's why habit, you know, just getting up at five in the morning, yeah, uh, you know, if you know, do that 20 times, 30 times, yeah, it becomes a habit, but it doesn't become a source of confidence unless we set ourselves a new, a new goal that our brain can't 100% predict, predict, and you know, can I, I wonder if I can do that. And you do that, and your brain says, oh, hold on a minute, I didn't predict that. And they, then it gives you a little spurt of dopamine. And that's why you need, that's why you need to be, you know, fairly constantly stretching yourself just a little bit and not always just in the same routine. Yes. Okay, last last one I was going to ask is uh, confidence over the lifespan. Does it like, for people who are listening are different ages and, and wondering, is there a, does it change over the human lifespan from, say, teenager, you know, kid to teenager to 20s to 30s to 40s? You know, does it change throughout the lifespan? It, 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 it's very, it, it, it does, and it depends on the society, you know. So it used to be people of my age felt, you know, would, would, would really feel like old people. And, and, you know, I'm not old in my own mind. And, and, and I'm, I'm therefore able, because I'm, I'm, stereotypes, or what are the ways of sabotaging confidence? Because the stereotypes contain kind of supposed instructions about how you have to behave or not. And these can be gender stereotypes or aging stereotypes or racial stereotypes. So it depends entirely on whether people can escape these these age-related stereotypes. Um, so the, the answer the answer is there's no easy answer to that. Mm. Um, and and, and the, there's absolutely no reason that anyone at any age any age can all learn to get the benefits of confidence. But remembering that it's not a general purpose thing, it depends on specific domains and building confidence brick by brick in, a, in an area and then helping learn from that and applying to another area. Wow, amazing. It does tend to, I, I, in my own experience, like I find the more successes and the more things where I feel like confident at, the more confident I am as a person. Like, yes. is that a true state? Like that it's kind of someone is confident because they feel competent or confident in a number of areas. So there can be a kind of meta confidence. So if you if you you know the, you 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 successfully built success in certain domains, and yes, there can come a time when you say, "Well, actually, I can learn. I I can do this in other domains I haven't tried yet," and that's a kind of meta. Confidence allows you a feeling that you can, um, you 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 can deal with uncertainty in situ in other situations. That you're not just tied to one area. So yes, um, and, and the thing is about confidence, it does influence self-esteem, and self-esteem is is partly of what 
what we, we all benefit from when we're, we're successful. But self-esteem doesn't create success in the way that confidence does. Self-esteem is a kind of response to success rather than a causal factor in success. Because confidence is action, taking action consistently. The action. It's yeah. the action. Yeah. It's been brilliant. I really, really enjoyed this, Ian. Yeah, brilliant. I love your work. Really, really do. Thank you. Thank really you. It was brilliant. great just talking with you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you've two, you've two books. So you've two books Got anyway. Loads, of, loads books. of books. But two, anyway, in recent years, there's one is uh, yeah. How Confidence Works and the other one is The Success Factor. Hey, the so Winner how Effect. Works, oh, sorry. And then The Winner Effect. And then there was a book in between them called The Stress Test, oh. which is how you can harness stress. Uh, to, to to perform better and, and 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 you can use stress as a form of energy. So which one, one? Which one was best received? Was the confidence one best received or confidence one? Uh, the the, win, the winner effect of the most translations, um, and the confidence one has probably the most sales in UK and Ireland. I would say, yeah, yeah. Wow, amazing! Yeah. Great subject matter, fascinating. Yeah. Loved uh, it. Well, Loved well, it. so much. Yeah, well, Brilliant. thank you. It was a great discussion. I've enjoyed meeting you both. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> likewise, likewise. And if you're ever out, maybe we'll have a swim together. Absolutely, in Bray, I'd love that. Yeah, let's is, do is it. Is that where you swim, you swim in Bray? In no, no, Harvest I swim Kalani. in Collymore or, or Vico or, you know, oh, Collymore. I love nice. Vico, I love Vico. We're Greystones, so we swim in the yeah, cove yeah. at Greystones every great. day. Ah, lovely. Yeah. I love the green. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to come out sometime. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. We'll send Thanks, a well, thanks, 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 thanks,